Good evening, and welcome to Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's installment provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep for once. So lie back, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath, and off we go. Before we begin tonight's reading, I'd like to give a shout out to yet another new Patreon subscriber, Alice Blackwell. Alice, thank you so much for supporting this podcast. It's much appreciated. If anyone is interested in checking out the perks available to subscribers, you'll find a link to the Patreon page in the show notes. Now let's get to the reading. Tonight we're reaching back into ancient Greece once again with Aristotle's History of Animals in 10 books. Translated by Richard Cresswell, M.A., St. John's College, Oxford. Published in London by George Bell & Sons, York Street, Covent Garden, 1887. Printed by William Close & Sons, Stamford Street and Charing Cross. Let's begin. Preface The following translation of Aristotle's History of Animals has been made from the text of Schneider. In a work of considerable difficulty, it is hardly possible entirely to avoid errors, but it is hoped that those which have escaped are neither numerous nor important. The notes of Schneider have been consulted throughout, and in places of difficulty, the English translation by Taylor the French of Camus, and the German of Strock have been severally referred to. The work itself is the most ancient and celebrated contribution to science which has come down to us, and it is hardly possible, when we consider the means of observation which were accessible at the time, to imagine a work of more accurate observation. From the numerous quotations in which our author avails himself of the experience of his predecessors in the same field, as well as corrects their errors, there can be no doubt that Aristotle had the advantage of many works which have perished in the lapse of ages. In the appendix to the present translation will be found the essay of Schneider on the sources whence Aristotle derived his knowledge of the animals he describes. And these sources, together with his own accurate observations, are probably sufficient to account for the correct knowledge of the history of animals displayed throughout the work. It is right, perhaps, to observe in this place that Dr. Smith, in his Dictionary of Biography, speaks of the history of animals as partly the result of the royal liberality of Alexander and doubtless Aristotle would gladly have introduced into his work any fresh materials which might have been made available to him either during his residence at the Macedonian court or by the subsequent victories of Alexander in the East if the information so obtained had reached Athens in sufficient time to be incorporated. But in the first instance, he would naturally use the materials ready to his hand in the works of his predecessors and these were not few. The animals also which he describes are principally those of Greece and of the countries with which the enterprising Greeks had frequent and commercial intercourse. He says little of the animals of the interior of Asia and of India, and speaks very cautiously of such as he does mention. And one who quotes his authority so freely would hardly have failed to notice the sources of his information. The study, or at least the knowledge of the classification of animals, appears to have been carefully pursued in the earliest period of man's history. The oldest records that we possess contain abundant notices of the peculiarities of animals. The Mosaic Law abounds in them, in its distinctions between the clean and the unclean, a distinction not then first established, but of the most remote antiquity. Indeed, it could hardly be otherwise than that men engaged in the pursuits of agriculture and the chase should study the habits of the animals that were valuable to them, as well as those which were injurious. 
A study thus commenced by necessity would eventually be pursued for its own sake, and not a few would be found who would investigate, and as far as they could, record the various phenomena they observed. The paintings of Egypt and the sculptures of Assyria are our witnesses of the skill with which animals and plants were drawn, and of the minute perception of their external forms and the knowledge thus gained in the ancient centers of civilization would be sure to circulate and increase when the intercourse with foreign nations spread the knowledge and philosophy so acquired. In the writings of Homer, we find that the knowledge of the anatomy of the human body had already made considerable progress, and the inspection of the animals offered in sacrifice cannot fail to have added much to the general knowledge of their history. A century later, we have the poems of Hesiod, devoted to the encouragement of agriculture and rural pursuits. Pythagoras, in the 7th century BC, may perhaps have left no writings, but we know that he was an eminent student and exponent of natural phenomena. His contemporary, Alcmaeon of Crotona, is especially mentioned by Aristotle and he is eminent among natural philosophers as the first who is said to have recommended to his followers the practice of dissection. Empedocles of Agrigentum left a work on the phenomena of nature, of which a few fragments still remain, and there were also others who, if they did not enter into the details of what we now call natural history, treated generally of the nature of things and opened the field to those who would study the subject in its particular parts. The empire of Persia was still the dominant power, and was carrying the civilization of the East to every part of the known world when Theseus wrote his great works, of which, unhappily, only a few fragments remain. He described not only the history of his own time, but also the natural history of Persia and of India, and that probably with more accuracy than has been usually attributed to him. India he had not visited personally, so that he could only describe it from the information of others. But this implies that he was not alone in the studies which he devoted to natural objects. With such predecessors, and aided by his own acute observations, we need not wonder that Aristotle produced a work which has ever been admired by naturalists, and must continue to rise in their estimation the longer it is in their hands. The index to the present volume has been formed on the basis of that of Schneider, and considerable pains have been taken to add as many names as possible from other sources, especially the index of Strach and Kulb's recent translation of the history of animals, both of which contain identifications of a great many animals. A few identifications have also been added from Little and Scott's lexicon, as well as from Professor Bell's catalogue of animals in Captain Spratt's work on Lycia, and the cephalopods are named from Professor Owen's article on that class in the Cyclopedia of Anatomy. It is hoped, therefore, that the index will be found to contain a greater number of suggestions for the identification of the animals mentioned by Aristotle than have been hitherto published collectively. It is also right to add that it has been compiled after the translation was completed, and therefore, in any differences which may be found between the identifications at the foot of the page and those given in the index, the reader will rather prefer the latter as the result of later research in works which were not accessible when the translation was made. Richard Cresswell, April 30th, 1862. Analytical Table of Contents. Book One. The work commences with a general review of the animal kingdom and several suggestions for a natural arrangement of animals in groups according to their external form or their mode of life, a comparison of animals among themselves, and a description of some of their habits. 
Aristotle then introduces the human form, the best known to man, as the standard of comparison to which he refers the rest of the animal kingdom. The concluding chapters of this book are occupied with a description of the several parts of the human body, both internal and external. Book 2 In the second book, the different parts of animals are described. The animals are arranged in various groups. Viviparous and oviparous quadrupeds, fish, serpents, birds. The only animals described are those with red blood, the description of the rest being reserved for the fourth book. Their internal organs are also described, and in the course of the book a few animals, as the ape, elephant, and chameleon are especially noticed. Book 3 The third book commences with a description of the internal organs, beginning with the generative system. A considerable portion of the book is devoted to the course of the veins, and Aristotle quotes from other writers, as well as states the result of his own observations. He then describes the nature of other constituent parts of the body, sinews, fibers, bone, marrow, cartilage, nails, hooves, claws, horns and beaks of birds, hair, scales, membranes, flesh, fat, blood, marrow, milk, and the spermatic fluid. Book 4 Animals without blood, and first, the cephalopods are described, then the crustaceans, testacea, echinidae, ascidians, actiniae, hermit crabs, insects. In the eighth chapter, the organs of sense are considered, and afterwards the voice, sleep, age, and differences of the sexes in animals are described. Book 5 In the former books, animals are for the most part described with reference to their several parts. In the fifth book, they are treated as entire, and especially with regard to their mode of reproduction. First of all, our author treats of spontaneous reproduction, and then of those animals which spring from a union of the sexes. And from this, he proceeds to some detail with respect to different groups of animals, testacea, crustacea, insects. The book concludes with a long description of bees and their habits. Book 6 In this book, the same subject is continued through the several classes of birds, fish, and quadrupeds. This account of the reproduction of animals includes also the consideration of the seasons, climates, and ages of animals, and how far these influence their reproduction. Book 7 The seventh book is almost entirely devoted to the consideration of the reproduction of man, and an account of man from his birth to his death. This book ends abruptly, and is probably imperfect. Book 8 In the eighth book, Aristotle passes on to the most interesting part of his work, the character and habits of the whole animal world as it was known to him. The amount of detail which he has collected and arranged on this subject is most interesting. He treats first of all of the food of animals, of their migrations, their health and diseases, and the influence of climate upon them. Book 9 The subject of the eighth book is continued, with an account of the relations in which animals stand to each other, and especially the friendship and hostility of different species. And these are, for the most part, refer to the nature of their food, and their mode of procuring it. The notices of fish are not so numerous as those of other groups. This would necessarily arise from the difficulty of observation. At the conclusion of the book, an essay on bees and their congeners is given at considerable length. 
Book 10. This book, in all probability erroneously ascribed to Aristotle, is occupied with a treatise on the cause of barrenness in the human species. It appears to be rather a continuation of the seventh book, which ends abruptly, but it is well placed at the end as no genuine work of our author. The History of Animals, Book the First, Chapter One. Some parts of animals are simple, and these can be divided into like parts, as flesh into pieces of flesh. Others are compound, and cannot be divided into like parts, as the hand cannot be divided into hands, nor the face into faces. Of these, some are not only called parts, but members, such as those which, though entire in themselves, are made up of other parts, as the head and the leg, the hand and the entire arm, or the trunk, for these parts are both entire in themselves and made up of other parts. All the compound parts also are made up of simple parts, the hand, for example, of flesh and sinew and bone. Some animals have all these parts the same, in others they are different from each other. Some of the parts are the same in form, as the nose and eye of one man is the same as the nose and eye of another man, and flesh is the same with flesh, and bone with bone. In like manner, we may compare the parts of the horse and of other animals, those parts, that is, which are the same in species, for the whole bears the same relation to the whole as the parts do to each other. And in animals belonging to the same class, the parts are the same, only they differ in excess or defect. By class, I mean such as bird or fish, for all these differ if either compared with their own class or with another, and there are many forms of birds and fishes. Nearly all their parts differ in them according to the opposition of their external qualities, such as color or shape, in that some are more, others are less affected, or sometimes in number more or less, or in size greater and smaller, or in any quality which can be included in excess or defect. For some animals have a soft skin, in others the skin is shelly. Some have a long bill as cranes, others a short one. Some have many feathers, others very few. Some also have parts which are wanting in others, for some species have spurs, others have none. Some have a crest, others have none. But, so to say, their principal parts and those which form the bulk of their body are either the same or vary only in their opposites and in excess and defect. By excess and defect, I mean the greater and the less, but some animals agree with each other in their parts neither in form nor in excess and defect, but have only an analogous likeness, such as a bone bears to a spine, a nail to a hoof, a hand to a crab's claw, the scale of a fish to the feather of a bird, for that which is a feather in the birds is a scale in the fish. With regard then to the parts which each class of animal possesses, they agree and differ in this manner, and also in the position of the parts. For many animals have the same parts, but not in the same position, as the mammae which are either pectoral or abdominal. But of the simple parts, some are soft and moist, others hard and dry. The soft parts are either entirely so, or so long as they are in a natural condition, as blood, serum, fat, tallow, marrow, semen, gall, milk, in those animals which give milk, flesh, and other analogous parts of the body. In another manner also the excretions of the body belong to this class, as phlegm and the excrements of the abdomen and bladder. The hard and dry parts are sinew, skin, vein, hair, bone, 
cartilage, nail, horn, for that part bears the same name and on the whole is called horn, and the other parts of the body which are analogous to these. Animals also differ in their manner of life, in their actions and dispositions, and in their parts. We will first of all speak generally of these differences, and afterwards consider each species separately. The following are the points in which they vary in manner of life, in their actions and dispositions. Some animals are aquatic, others live on the land, and the aquatic may again be divided into two classes, for some entirely exist and procure their food in the water, and take in and give out water and cannot live without it. This is the nature of most fishes. But there are others which, though they live and feed in the water, do not take in water but air, and produce their young out of the water. Many of these animals are furnished with feet, as the otter and the latex and the crocodile, or with wings as the seagull and diver, and others are without feet as the water serpent. Some procure their food from the water and cannot live out of the water, but neither inhale air nor water as the akalefe and the oyster. Different aquatic animals are found in the sea, in rivers, in lakes, and in marshes as the frog and newt, and of marine animals, some are pelagic, some littoral, and some saxatile. Some land animals take in and give out air, and this is called inhaling and exhaling. Such are man and all other land animals which are furnished with lungs. Some, however, which procure their food from the earth, do not inhale air, as the wasp, the bee, and all other insects. By insects, I mean those animals which have divisions in their bodies, whether in the lower part only, or both in the upper and lower. Many land animals, as I have already observed, procure their food from the water, but there are no aquatic or marine animals which find their food on land. There are some animals which at first inhabit the water, but afterwards change into a different form and live out of the water. This happens to the gnat in the rivers, which afterwards becomes an ostrum. Again, there are some creatures which are stationary, while others are locomotive. The fixed animals are aquatic, but this is not the case with any of the inhabitants of the land. Many aquatic animals also grow upon each other. This is the case with several genera of shellfish. The sponge also exhibits some signs of sensation, for they say that it is drawn up with some difficulty unless the attempt to remove it is made stealthily. Other animals also there are which are alternately fixed together or free. This is the case with a certain kind of akalefe. Some of these become separated during the night and emigrate. Many animals are separate from each other, but incapable of voluntary movement, as oysters and the animal called holothuria. Some aquatic animals are swimmers, as fish and the mollusca, and the malacostrica and the crabs. Others creep on the bottom, as the crab, for this, though an aquatic animal, naturally creeps. Of land animals, some are furnished with wings, as birds and bees, and these differ in other respects from each other. Others have feet and of this class some species walk, others crawl, and others creep in the mud. There is no animal which has only wings, as fish have only fins. For those animals whose wings are formed by an expansion of the skin can walk. And the bat has feet, the seal has imperfect feet. Among birds there are some with very imperfect feet, which are therefore called apodes. They are, however, provided with very strong wings, and almost all birds that are similar to this one have strong wings and imperfect feet, as the swallow and draponis. 
for all this class of birds is alike both in habits and in the structure of their wings, and their whole appearance is very similar. The apos is seen at all times of the year, but the drapanis can only be taken in rainy weather during the summer, and on the whole is a rare bird. Many animals, however, can both walk and swim. The following are the differences exhibited by animals in their habits and their actions. Some of them are gregarious and others solitary, both in the classes which are furnished with feet and those which have wings or fins. Some partake of both characters, and of those that are gregarious as well as those that are solitary, some unite in societies and some are scattered. Gregarious birds are such as the pigeon, stork, swan, but no bird with hooked claws is gregarious. Among swimming animals, some fish are gregarious, as the dromas, tunny, palamis, and amia. But man partakes of both qualities. Those which have a common employment are called social but that is not the case with all gregarious animals. Man and the bee, the wasp and the ant, and the stork belong to this class. Some of these obey a leader, others are anarchical. The stork and the bee are of the former class. The ant and many others belong to the latter. Some animals, both in the gregarious and solitary class, are limited to one locality, others are migratory. There are also carnivorous animals, herbivorous, omnivorous, and others which eat peculiar food, as the bee and the spider. The former eats only honey and a few other sweet things, while spiders prey upon flies, and there are other animals which feed entirely on fish. Some animals hunt for their food, and some make a store, which others do not. There are also animals which make habitations for themselves, and others which do not. The mole, the mouse, the ant, and the bee make habitations, but many kinds of both insects and quadrupeds make no dwelling. With regard to situation, some are troglodyte, as lizards and serpents. Others, as the horse and dog, live upon the surface of the earth. Some kinds of animals burrow in the ground, others do not. Some animals are nocturnal, as the owl and the bat. Others use the hours of daylight. There are tame animals and wild animals. Man and the mule are always tame, the leopard and the wolf are invariably wild, and others, as the elephant, are easily tamed. We may, however, view them in another way, for all the genera that have been tamed are found wild also, as horses, oxen, swine, sheep, goats, and dogs. Some animals utter a loud cry, some are silent, and others have a voice, which in some cases may be expressed by a word, in others it cannot. There are also noisy animals and silent animals, musical and unmusical kinds, but they are mostly noisy about the breeding season. Some, as the dove, frequent fields, others, as the hoopoe, live on the mountains. Some attach themselves to man, as the pigeon, some are lascivious as the partridge and domestic fowl, and others are chaste as the raven which rarely cohabits. Again, there are classes of animals furnished with weapons of offense, others with weapons of defense. In the former I include those which are capable of inflicting an injury or of defending themselves when they are attacked. In the latter, those which are provided with some natural protection against injury. Animals also exhibit many differences of disposition. Some are gentle, peaceful, and not violent as the ox. 
Some are violent, passionate, and intractable as the wild boar. Some are prudent and fearful as the stag and the hare. Serpents are illiberal and crafty. Others as the lion are liberal, noble, and generous. Others are brave, wild, and crafty like the wolf. For there is this difference between the generous and the brave. The former means that which comes of a noble race, the latter that which does not easily depart from its own nature. Some animals are cunning and evil disposed as the fox. Others as the dog are fierce, friendly, and fawning. Some are gentle and easily tamed as the elephant. Some are susceptible of shame and watchful as the goose. Some are jealous and fond of ornament as the peacock. But man is the only animal capable of reasoning, though many others possess the faculty of memory and instruction in common with him. No other animal but man has the power of recollection. In another place, we will treat more accurately of the disposition and manner of life in each class. Chapter 2 all animals possess in common those parts by which they take in food and into which they receive it. But these parts agree or differ in the same way as all the other parts of bodies, that is, either in shape or size, or proportion or position. And besides these, almost all animals possess many other parts in common, such as those by which they reject their excrements and the part by which they take their food, though this does not exist in all. The part by which the food is taken in is called the mouth. That which receives the food from the mouth is called the stomach. The part by which they reject the excrement has many names. The excrement being of two kinds, the animals which possess receptacles for the fluid excrement have also receptacles for the dry but those which have the latter are not always furnished with the former. Wherefore all animals which have a bladder have a belly also, but not all that have a belly have a bladder, for the part appropriated to the reception of the liquid excrement is called the bladder, and that for the reception of the dry is called the belly. Many animals possess both these parts, and that also by which the semen is emitted. Among animals that have the power of generation, some emit the semen into themselves, and some inject it into others. The former are called female, the latter male. In some animals there is neither male nor female, and there is a diversity in the form of the parts appropriated to this office. For some animals have a uterus, others have only something analogous to the uterus. These are the most essential organs, some of which exist in all animals, others in the majority only. Chapter 3 There is only one sense, that of touch, which is common to all animals, so that no exact name can be given to the part in which this sense resides, for in some animals it is the same, in others only analogous. Every living creature is furnished with moisture, and must die if deprived of this moisture, either in the course of nature or by force. But in what part of the body this moisture resides is another question. In some animals it is found in the blood and veins. In others the situation is only analogous, but these are imperfect as fibers and serum. The sense of touch resides in the simple parts, as in the flesh and in other similar places, and generally in those parts which contain blood, at least in those animals which have blood. In others it resides in the analogous parts, but in all animals in the simple parts. The capacity of action resides in the compound parts, as the preparation of food in the mouth, 
and the power of locomotion in the feet or wings or the analogous parts. Again, some animals are sanguinous, as man, the horse, and all perfect animals, whether apodous, bipeds, or quadrupeds. And some animals are without blood, as the bee and the wasp, and such marine animals as the sepia and the carabus, and all animals with more than four legs. Chapter 4 there are also viviparous, oviparous, and vermiparous animals. The viviparous are such as man and the horse, the seal and others which have hair, and among marine animals, the cetacea, as the dolphin and those which are called salacae. Some of these are furnished with a blowhole, but have no gills, as the dolphin and the whale. The dolphin has its blowhole on the back, the whale in its forehead. Others have open gills, as the salacae, the gallius, and the batus. That is called the egg of the perfect fetus, from which the future animal is produced, from a part at first, while the remainder serves for its food. The worm is that from the whole of which the future animal is produced and the fetus afterwards acquires parts and increases in size. Some viviparous animals are internally oviparous, as the salacae. Others are internally viviparous, as mankind and the horse. In different animals, the fetus assumes a different form when first brought into the world, and is either a living creature, an egg, or a worm. The eggs of some animals, as birds, are hard-shelled and are of two colors. Those of the salacae and some other animals are soft-skinned and have only one color. Some species of the vermiform fetus are capable of motion, others are not. But in another place, when we treat of generation, we will dwell more accurately on these subjects. Chapter 5. Some animals have feet, others have none. Of the former, some have two feet, as mankind and birds only. Others have four, as the lizard and the dog. Others, as the scalopendra and bee, have many feet. But all have their feet in pairs. And among apodous swimming animals, some have fins, as fish and of these some have two fins in the upper and two in the lower parts of their bodies, as the chrysophis and labrax. Others, which are very long and smooth, have only two fins, as the eel and conjure. Others have none at all, as the lamprey and others, which live in the sea as serpents do on land, and in like manner swim in moist places and some of the genus Salacae, as those which are flat and have tails, as the Batos and Trigon, have no fins. These fish swim by means of their flat surfaces, but the Batrachus has fins, and so have all those fish which are not very thin in proportion to their width. But the animals which have apparent feet, as the Cephalopods, swim both with their feet and fins, and move quickly upon the hollow parts of their bodies, as the sepia, toothis, and polypus. But none of them can walk except the polypus. Those animals which have hard skins, as the carabus, swim with their hinder parts, and move very quickly upon their tail with the fins which are drawn upon it, and the newt both with its feet and tail, and, to compare small things with great, it has a tail like the glanis. Some winged animals, as the eagle and the hawk, are feathered. Others, as the cockchafer and the bee, membranaceous wings. And others, as the alapex and the bat, have wings formed of skin. Both the feathered and leather-winged tribes have blood, but the insects, which have naked wings, have no blood. 
Again, the feathered and leather-winged animals are all either bipeds or apodes, for they say there are winged serpents in Ethiopia. The feathered tribe of animals is called birds. The other two tribes have no exact names. Among winged creatures without blood, some are coleopterous, for they have elytra over their wings, as the cockchafer and the beetles, and others are without elytra. The animals of this class have either two or four wings. Those with four wings are distinguished by their greater size or a caudal sting. The diptera are either such as are small or have a sting in their head. The coleoptera have no sting at all. The diptera have a sting in their head, as the fly, horsefly, gadfly, and gnat. All bloodless animals, except a few marine species of the cephalopoda, are smaller than those which have blood. These animals are the largest in warm waters, and more so in the sea than on the land and in fresh water. All creatures that are capable of motion are moved by four or more limbs. Those with blood have four limbs only, as man has two hands and two feet. Birds have two wings and two feet. Quadrupeds and fishes have four feet or four fins. But those animals which have two wings or none at all as the serpent are nevertheless moved by four limbs, for the bendings of their body are four in number, or two when they have two wings. Those bloodless animals which have more than four feet, whether furnished with feet or wings, always have more than four organs of locomotion, as the ephemera, which has four feet and four wings. And in this, it not only agrees with its peculiar manner of life, from which it also derives its name, but also that it is winged and four-footed. And all creatures, whether they have four feet or many feet, move in the same direction, for they all move in the long way of their bodies. All other animals have two leading feet. The crab alone has four. Chapter 6 The following are the principal classes which include other animals. Birds, fishes, cetacea. All these have red blood. There is another class of animals covered with a shell and called shellfish and an anonymous class of soft-shelled animals, Malacostrica, which includes Karabi, Carcini, and Astasi, and another of Mollusca, such as Tuthis, Tuthos, and Sepia, and another class of annulose animals. All these are without blood, and the species with feet have many feet. There are no large classes of other animals, for there are many forms which are not included under a single form, but either stand alone, having no specific difference, as man, or have specific differences, but the classes are anonymous. All animals with four feet and no wings have blood. Some of these are viviparous, others oviparous. The viviparous are not all covered with hair, but the oviparous have scales. The scale of a reptile is similar in situation to the scale of a fish. The class of serpents, sanguineous land animals, is naturally without feet. Though some have feet, this class is also covered with scales. All serpents except the viper are oviparous. The viper alone is viviparous, so that not all viviparous animals have hair, for some fishes are also viviparous. All animals, however, that have hair are viviparous, for we may consider the prickles of the hedgehog and porcupine as analogous to the hair of animals, for they answer the purpose of hair and not as in marine animals that are so covered of feet. There are also many classes of viviparous quadrupeds, 
but they have never received names. Each kind must therefore be taken separately as man. As we speak of lion, stag, horse, dog, and of others in like manner, there is, however, one class of those that have a mane called Lofuri. As the horse, ass, mule, Guinness, Hennis, and those which in Syria are called mules, from their resemblance, though not quite of the same form. They copulate and produce young from each other, so that it is necessary to consider well the nature of each of them separately. We have now treated of these things in an outline, for the sake of giving a taste of what we are afterwards to consider and of how many. Hereafter, we will speak of them more accurately, in order that we may first of all examine into their points of difference and agreement, and afterwards we will endeavor to inquire into the causes of these things. But it will be a more natural arrangement to do so when we treat of the history of each, for it is evident from these things what they are, and what we have to demonstrate. Our first subject of consideration must be the parts of which animals are made up, for these constitute the chief and the whole difference among them, either because they have them or are without them, or these parts vary in position or arrangement, or in any of the differences mentioned before, in form, size, proportion, and difference of accidents. First of all, then, we will consider the parts of the human body, for, as everyone can best understand the standard of money with which he is most familiar, so it is in other things. And of necessity, man must be the best known to us of all animals. The parts of the body are, indeed, plain enough to everyone's common sense, but that we may not forsake our arrangement, and may have reason as well as perception, we will speak first of all of the organic, and afterwards of the simple parts. And with that overview completed, that seems like as good a point as any to end tonight's reading from Aristotle's History of Animals in Ten Books. I find it fascinating to think how much this 2,300 year old work gets right. That said, having leafed through the rest, I would not recommend you use this as a textbook. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, you'll find a link to a free ebook version in the show notes. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Until our next boring book, good night.